This is KSL Sunday Edition with Boyd Matheson. Welcome to Sunday Edition. I am Boyd Matheson. Each Sunday we attempt to divide the rage from the reason, elevate the conversation, connect the dots, and make the news make sense. We have conversations with great thinkers, great leaders, and great people making a difference. We talk politics so we can discuss society, and we explore society so we can discuss principles and the people in America who live them. We bring the best and brightest to Utah, and we send the Utah model to our nation's capital and beyond. So while presidential politics and congressional chaos have been front and center once again this week, it's worth pausing to note that the answers to most of the issues that ail the nation will not come from the marbled halls of our nation's capital, but will come through citizens of civil society, armed by civic virtue and committed to the principles that founded our constitutional republic. Robert P. George, known as Robbie George to many, holds Princeton's celebrated McCormick Professorship of Jurisprudence and is founder and director of the university's James Madison program in American Ideals and Institutions. He has served as the chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom and on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, among many honors, accolades, and accomplishments. Professor George presented a lecture on the Constitution and Civic Virtue for the Wheatley Institute at Brigham Young University on Thursday this past week. I had the privilege of sitting down with him for an elevated conversation prior to his address. Take a look. Well, Robbie George, it is great to be with you down here on the campus of BYU Wheatley Institute. Uh, you're down here for uh, an important uh, conversation, an important message around the Constitution and civic virtue. We don't always connect those two <laughs> things together. Uh, and so that's exactly where I want to start, is why is it that we need to make that crucial connection between Constitution and civic virtue? Well, thank you, Boyd, and it's a pleasure to be with you and a great pleasure to be at this uh, wonderful university, Brigham Young University, where I've been welcomed yeah. so many times uh, in <laughs> so the past. So they're gonna start charging you taxes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but we'll pay. keep you. <laughs> Well, uh, my lecture this evening is going to be on the Constitution and civic virtue, and it's going to address this question. Do constitutional structures, the institutions of the Constitution, the ones set up by the Constitution, the, the separation of powers, our system of federalism, our Bill of Rights, do constitutional structures do all the work that's needed to maintain this what our founders called experiment in yeah. republican government and ordered liberty, or, you, or do you need something more than that? Yeah. And my argument is going to be that the Constitution and its structures are a necessary condition for the preservation of republican freedom, but they're not sufficient. Something else is needed beyond the structures, and that something else is virtue in the people. And our founders themselves who bequeath to us this great Constitution understood this. And I'll be quoting some of the founding fathers, John Adams, uh, for example. Uh, Adams famously said, our Constitution is made for a moral and religious people and will serve well no other kind of people. What he was putting his finger on there was the idea that, yes, the structures are good and they're valuable and even necessary, but they will not hold what we now call democracy, what our founders preferred to call Republican government, yeah. together, mm. unless the people have certain virtues. Yeah. They've got to be public-spirited. Yeah. They've uh, got to be concerned about each other. Mm. They have to be willing to treat each other, even when they disagree, even when they profoundly disagree, as fellow citizens, not as enemies to be defeated or destroyed. Yeah. Love that. Uh, so I want to unpack several of those pieces. There's a, there's a lot in there. Uh, and, let, and let's start from the structural standpoint. Uh, we always talk about federalism uh, being the key to so much of this, of getting things back to that state uh, focus there. Uh, kind of unpack that for us in terms of where we are in terms of federalism today. Obviously, we have a distrust. We're, we're really stress testing the nation in a new way. We've stress tested under world wars and pandemics. Uh, now we're having this stress test in the absence of trust and particularly the trust in the institutions. Uh, how do we get past that and, and again, connect it back into uh, what I think is the cottage industry of developing those virtues that you spoke about? Well, the first thing I want to say is that you're absolutely right on the data. That, all the data show that we have had not only a loss, a collapse yeah. of trust, yeah. and not just in governmental institutions. Yeah. It's important to see this, Boyd. 
we've lost our trusts even in the institutions of religion, mm -hmm. the institutions of civil society. We've lost our concern about and our sense of the importance of the family. On this question of federalism, one of the great structural protections of freedom in our Constitution, uh, when the American revolutionaries, against all odds, and uh, surprising even themselves, defeated the British and were able to become an independent nation, to create an independent nation, the question they faced, of course, is, well, now what kind of government will we establish here? They could have said, let's establish a new and better monarchy. And there was some sentiment in favor of that, right. mainly because they had the ideal monarch. They had George Washington. Right a guy who didn't want to be king. That's your best king, a guy who doesn't want to be king. Yeah. But they opted instead for a republic, but they did so in fear and trembling. And that's because all previous republics, going back into antiquity or the Middle Ages or the Renaissance city-states, all previous republics had failed. And when they failed, they tended to fail by collapsing into the worst forms of tyranny. So. Our founders knew they faced a, a, a real challenge there. How were they going to meet the challenge? Well, they looked at previous forms of government and they noticed that uh, in all other states, all other nations, there was a central government that basically had a lock on power and it could delegate some of that power, devolve state power to regional or provincial governments or to municipal governments. But at the end of the day, there was an all powerful central state. And that, they thought, was the real danger to liberty and to republican order. Too much power concentrated in the central state. Human nature being what it is, unchecked, unlimited power, power concentrated in one place is a bad thing. We need checks and balances. We need accountability. We need limitations on power. So the first limitation that they came up with, and it was such an ingenious idea, was to establish the new government of the United States not as a government of general jurisdiction, like the government of France or the government of England, having all power and maybe delegating some down to regional or municipal governments, but as a government of delegated and enumerated powers, given certain powers and denied all other powers. And that left the states then as governments of general jurisdiction exercising plenary authority, or what we in our tradition call police powers, the powers to protect public health, safety, and morals and uh, advance the, the common good. So that division of powers, limiting the power of the dangerous, far away, unaccountable uh, central government, that, that was the real yeah. key to the system. And then they introduced, of course, even at the federal level, the doctrine of the separation of powers, which was to make sure that there were yeah. those checks and balances and therefore the accountability yeah. that they hoped would enable Republican government for the first time in history to long endure, as Lincoln would later say, right. to survive. That, that long enduring is the, is the real key there. And, and so we have the, the structure of the Constitution uh, that's really there so that we the people can form a more perfect union. When we come back, we're going to break down what it is in the civic virtues that allow we the people to form that more perfect union. We'll be right back. Well, we're staying with the conversation with Robbie George uh, down here with the Wheatley Institute at Brigham Young, Brigham Young University. And Robbie, as, as we look at how we get down to the virtue component to this, what is the we the people? One of the things that has been a, a real harm, hallmark of your career, your life, is that focus on those core principles, those core virtues, and looking at it from an aspect of truth, that uh, we should be truth seekers and truth speakers and forever learners. Explain that for us. Well, I think that's the job of a teacher. I consider it my vocation as a, a professor. And that is to form our students, our young men and women, those entrusted to our care, to our charge, to be determined truth seekers, courageous truth speakers, and lifelong learners. And I think if we form our students in that way, they will also be loyal and effective citizens, mm. enabling this grand experiment in ordered liberty and Republican government to go on, passing it on to their children and grandchildren and so forth down through the years. Yeah, so important. Uh, 
We had an interesting discussion this past week talking about uh, going to the declaration uh, and this pursuit of happiness phrase. And of course, we usually use that pursuit of happiness when we're justifying narcissism and oh, <laughs> self-absorption. Such a misunderstanding. So boy. far oh. off. So, oh. so dive into that. The, the fact that the founders really believed that in order to pursue happiness, you had to pursue virtue. <laughs> they did indeed. <laughs> um, unfortunately, the word happiness has taken on connotations quite different from the connotations the word had uh, at the time of the American founding. When we think of happiness today, we think of a pleasant psychological state, which might be induced by drugs or right. being put on some <laughs> sort of machine. Uh, you take enough Valium, you're, you're happy, right? You have a smile on your face. That's not what the founding generation of Americans meant by happiness. The concept had a moral inflection. Um, you can still get a feel for that because we can still understand what someone's saying if they say or if we read in an old document, happy the man who walks in the way of justice. We know when we hear that sentence that that doesn't mean that the man who walks in the way of justice is going to go around <laughs> with a smile on his face uh, and in a happy state of mind. It, it means more something like blessed is the man, fortunate is the man, um, uh, uh, it, the concept of happiness that we have in the Declaration is really one much more like um, beatitude, something like that. So um, pursuing happiness doesn't mean doing what you want, whatever you want. You know, being dragged around by your wants, being the slave of your desires and passions, no matter how wayward uh, they are. No, pursuing happiness means trying to do the right thing living virtuously, fulfilling your responsibilities, taking pleasure in doing the right thing rather than trying to find one's pleasure wherever one's emotions or feelings or desires are pushing one. You've been part of some uh, extraordinary conversations, interfaith, across the political spectrum. Uh, what kind of conversations do we need to get to in this country? Clearly, we need a space for people to bring their whole authentic self into the public square, uh, that faith shouldn't be uh, just consigned to the synagogue, the mosque, the chapel, the pew, or the, or the closet. Uh, how should or around we be the having dinner those? table or, or yeah. at your, on your knees at bedtime. Yeah. It's got to be in the public. Yeah. yeah. And so how do we create space for that? And uh, one of the other things you alluded to earlier uh, is that we have to maintain that kind of radical curiosity about why someone who believes different or thinks different does that. We might actually learn something. Exactly right. Our nation is exceptional. We have this concept of American exceptionalism, and it doesn't mean, hey, uh, we're better than yeah. everybody else. We're more virtuous people. We know we're made out of the same flesh and yeah. blood as anybody else. We've got the same fallen nature mm -hmm. as anybody else. We've got our sins and faults and failings. No, what's exceptional about America, what the concept of American exceptionalism is, is the idea that unlike nations whose foundations and whose sources of unity are in blood and soil or throne and altar, a common ethnicity, a common race, a common religion, a common cultural heritage and so forth, instead of that, which we can't have in the United States because our people come from everywhere, from East Asia, from Africa, from South Asia, from uh, Europe, our people are many races, many ethnicities, many different religions, right. many different cultural backgrounds and, and traditions. Our, our foundation and unity can't be in that. Rather, the sources of our unity, our foundation, are in our shared commitment to the principles of the Declaration and the Constitution, to the idea that human beings have a certain profound, inherent, and equal dignity that it doesn't matter where we come from, what language we speak, it doesn't matter what religion we practice, it doesn't you know, matter who our ancestors were. What, what matters is our commitment, what unifies us is our commitment to the proposition that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And what we are missing, Boyd, and what we need to get back is a commitment to the kinds of beliefs and principles that used to support that unity. And that is why I've declared the month of June to be Fidelity Month. And we'll be celebrating the second Fidelity Month this coming June. And Fidelity Month is meant to be an occasion when all Americans of all faiths, all races, all traditions, rededicate ourselves to those principles that used to be the sources of our unity, 
fidelity to God. That was shared by Jews, Christians, Protestants, Catholics, LDS, Baptists, it didn't matter. Fidelity to God united us. Fidelity to spouses and families, being a real father or mother to your children, not turning that job over to the devices, <laughs> right. and so forth. And then third, fidelity to country and community. Remembering what John F. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Same for your community. We're going to stay with this principle of fidelity and the lessons from the community and cottage industry of passing those principles and virtues on to the next generation when we continue on Sunday edition here on KSL 5 TV. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Sunday Edition. You know, I learned from my dad that endings matter. As my conversation with Robbie George was coming to an end, he shared principles and lessons learned from his father that have driven him and should inspire all of us. So I want to stay with, with this idea of fidelity and Fidelity Month. I, I love that and that, in, that integrity to those principles. Uh, and as you mentioned, it starts around a kitchen table. Uh, these Absolutely. are not things that come from the marbled halls of Congress. Uh, this happens in the, the living room and around the kitchen table. Uh, that, that civil society that is uh, so important to the nation. And uh, I know this is a tender time for you from a family standpoint, but it's those principles that we learn, not just uh, sitting in a pew or uh, listening to a sermon or reading a scriptural text, but by watching people that matter in our lives and community live them. Uh, you shared with me uh, an experience you saw early on of your father. Yeah. Uh, that I think has become uh, both defining in you, present in you clearly, uh, but share that with us. When I was 12 years old, uh, I watched my World War II veteran hero father dash across an open field to rush into a burning house to rescue a paraplegic man in a wheelchair. And that was my dad. He has lived a a blessed life, mm -hmm. all the way from being fished out of the English Channel in World War II when he was crossing the Channel in a troop carrier uh, to fight in the Normandy campaign, and he somehow survived that uh, through that episode with rushing into the burning building to rescue the paraplegic man. I learned the virtues, not from the government, not from the courts, not from the economy, and not all that much to tell you the truth from school. <laughs> <laughs> you learn them from mom and dad, grandmother and grandfather, auntie and uncle, pastor, coach, teacher, so those human beings Community. who know you by name. Yeah. Unlike the courts, unlike the government. Well, if they know you by name in the courts, you're in trouble. You're <laughs> <laughs> unlike the government, unlike the economy. Uh, now, it's very important that all those big institutions be in good health but they can only be in good health if the people who, who constitute them, one way or another, are virtuous. And those virtues are transmitted most fundamentally by the family, supported by the church and other institutions of what we call civil society. Uh, we always say community and culture lead, uh, politics is downstream and, and it all follows, and, but it is a cottage industry. Uh, it starts with those principles uh, because that's what enables us uh, when people know you by name, when there is that personal connection. Uh, everything changes, even across our differences. I think that's how we well, get to right. dignity uh, because we not only see the dignity in the other, we see the divinity in the other. Well, and exactly. that's a different conversation. Exactly right. If you've raised more than one child, and I, I know many of the people listening to us will have big, big gangs of uh, kids, uh, you know, even if you've just raised two, you know they're different. No two kids are alike, and their needs are different. And, uh, you know, uh, even when it comes to discipline, you know, you have to be a little gentler with some, you can be a little tougher mm -hmm. uh, with others. Uh, uh, what works in terms of education for one may be different from what works for the other. Government can't take account of those differences. The courts can't take account of those differences. Big corporations can't take account of those differences. Mom and dad can. Yeah. Grandma and grandpa can. Auntie and uncle, coach, teacher, pastor. They know you by name. And not only know you by name, they know that you're on the more sensitive side yeah. or maybe the more extroverted <laughs> side. Yeah. Or, 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 or they know where your strengths are, but they also know where you need a little yeah. extra help and, and support. Um, 
being a human being is an individual business at a certain <laughs> level, you know, and individuals yeah. differ. Yeah. Uh, and if we're gonna if we're gonna be a virtuous people, then the people responsible for forming these individuals, beginning with the parents, have got to do their job. Final question for you, Robert, before we let you go on, on a very busy day. Uh, get us to the, we always like to get to the essence of the essence. What is, what is it when it comes to the Constitution and civic virtue? What do you wish that we were thinking different, doing different, or talking differently about? I think we have to just stop treating our fellow citizens who disagree with us as enemies. Just stop that. Our disagreements are profound. Uh, as you know, I have strong views on some very fundamental issues. Sanctity of human life, marriage as the conjugal union of husband and wife, religious freedom and the rights of conscience. But in my work at Princeton University and in the broader academic community, as you would imagine, I spend a lot of time with a lot of people who disagree with me about those deeply held, cherished, even identity forming for me beliefs. But I have had to learn, and I have to discipline myself to do it, to understand that these people with whom I disagree are not bad people. They are not my enemies to be defeated and destroyed. They are my fellow citizens and my friends. And that our relationship has to be one of friendship despite those disagreements. Now we're going to be struggling hard, sometimes against each other in the political domain. Marriage is either going to be the union of a man or a woman or it's going to be something very, very different, right? So we're going to fight about that. <laughs> but we need to do it using the proper forms of deliberative democracy as established by the Constitution. We have to share a commitment to that, despite our differences yeah. on these substantive moral issues. Uh, uh, be joined together in that commitment to the procedures of democracy and to a respect for each other's rights, the rights to freedom of speech and freedom of religion and so forth and so on. Um, and we need to recognize each other as friends, civic friends, fellow citizens. Fellow travelers, that's the name of the game. Robbie George, we always appreciate your ability to not only help us divide the rage from the reason, uh, but that you trust everyone that you interact with to act in the light of that reason. And we appreciate you joining us today. It was my very great pleasure, Boyd. Thank you. And we pay a special tribute to the legacy of Robbie George's father and his fidelity to those virtues. That wraps it up for us on Sunday Edition. I'm Boyd Matheson. Thanks for joining us. And as always, as you go out into the world, make sure you see something that inspires, say something that uplifts, and do something that makes a difference. Music in the Spoken Word is next. Thank you.